Okay, let's pray, guys. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here. We thank you, Father, for the relationship we have because of your son. And, uh, and we pray, Father, that you continue to be with this body of believers as we, as we strive to help others to find that relationship. Father, we, uh, uh, we pray for Cole tonight. We pray for all of our young, young guys that are going to be preaching, uh, are going to be teaching these classes. And I pray, Father, you be with each one of them as they prepare their notes and get ready to, for, their, for their week. Uh, Father, we pray for Felipe, and we pray for his situation. We pray for the family, and we pray, Father, that you encourage him and that you'd help us. If there's anything we can do, that you'd make that known to us so that we can do the things that need, he needs that done in his life. And, Father, we pray for Kim and her family as they mourn the loss of Marlon. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, that you help us as a, as a body of believers to reach out to her and to touch her and to encourage her as she grieves uh, right now over her loss. Uh, thank you, Father, again, for bringing us here. Thank you for being our God and for loving us so much. And thank you for the opportunities that are going to come. Help us to be aware of them every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. If you'll open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. So this is our summer Wednesday night summer series uh, for the next seven or eight Wednesdays, uh, culminating in, in July. We're going to be moving through what I have termed marks of maturity. We're going to be looking specifically at First Peter chapter, uh, Second Peter rather, chapter one, verses five through eleven, and specifically at this list that he gives us in Second Peter. I'm going to read briefly through this passage in verse five. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, to start this off, I'd like to introduce 2 Peter and the, the epistle of 2 Peter. Uh, what we need to know about this book is of all the New Testament writings, so of all the writings that we have in the New Testament, Second Peter is the most contested in our modern Bibles. So it is the epistle that critics will most often point to and say this wasn't written by its author. Okay? The reason for that is historically it isn't attested to as well as other New Testament letters. What I mean by that is this. Eusebius notes in 325 in his Ecclesiastical History that the epistle is not universally accepted at his time and in, in, is in fact disputed by some. Jerome, who translated the Bible into the Latin, uh, into Latin, also notes that during his time after Asubius, the text is still disputed. The earliest direct reference, so the earliest writer we have in antiquity who talks about Second Peter specifically is origin in 253 AD. That is well after most of the other epistles. So in other words, most of the other epistles by the time of origin have been directly referenced by church fathers, yet Second Peter had not. Uh, further, Second Peter is alluded to in other early writings. So in writings like First Clement, which came about 95 AD, Second Clement, Second Clement and others, we do have references to Second Peter, but just no direct mentions of the letter. Um, it is important to note that those critical of Petrine authorship rest their case on various issues of style of writing, the lack of early direct attestation, and a plethora of pseudon pseudonymous works claiming Petrine authorship. In other words, it was very common for ancient writers to claim to be Peter and to write in his name. This isn't a big deal uh, in, in the ancient world. That was a very common practice. For example, a very popular one that we're, what, what we should be aware of is the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch claims to be uh, from Enoch, the one who was taken up by God. 
it's written in his name and it's written from his point of view but it, it comes from the second temple period of, of judaism so this would be after they've rebuilt the temple or during while they're rebuilding the temple of herod so this was a common practice and it's because of those things modern critics have a problem with it um one thing we should be aware though that even modern even those modern scholars who are critical of petrine authorship note that the historical attestation to second peter even though it is the worst in the new testament if that is all we had to go on they say they would be forced to admit that second peter is authentic and when speaking about Eusebius and jerome and origin even though they note that it was disputed that uh its legitimacy was disputed by some in the church right they pushed for its acceptance into the canon ultimately the church did accept it specifically at the um at the council of hippo and carthage in the fourth century they did accept second peter and that's um important because it was also at these councils that they rejected other pseudon pseudonymous works by P supposedly by peter so in other words they were to evaluate multiple works that were claimed to have been written by peter and they looked at what was actually what they believed from their understanding of it was peter and what wasn't and so they rejected pseudon pseudonymous works and they accepted second peter um so ultimately second peter was accepted by the early church it just took them a while there are other works in the New Testament that are like this. Revelation was like this. It took the church a while to accept its canonicity. So this isn't anything new or, or particular to Second Peter. The pushback against it being one of style is, is a major issue of subjectivity. For example, um, if you employ the use of a scribe in your writing, which we know Peter did, if we go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, or rather chapter 5, we go back to first peter chapter 5 he points out that silas helped me write this the gospel of mark for example we know that mark according to clement of alexandria um and other early writers we know that mark was peter's uh translator and so mark wrote down the recollections of peter in a gospel form so we know that peter consistently employed the use of others to help him write his letters and write his works and so the the question of style really isn't isn't that isn't that big of a deal um some of the other pushback that they have really isn't relevant to second peter um so everybody that i looked at essentially this is what it boiled down to if you were a literary critic and liberal scholar there is no amount of evidence to convince you that second peter was written by peter if you are a conservative scholar who believes that the bible is the word of god then all there is no evidence enough to convince you that it isn't authentic that's essentially where the scholarship stands on this like everything else the evidence is really in the eye of the beholder what i what is most convincing to me however is that although they that although some in the early church disputed it your major writers your major thinkers the ones who dealt with this stuff on a regular basis and who knew the eyewitnesses did not have a problem accepting second peter further we know that some of the earliest writings some of the earliest writings from the church fathers we know that they pulled some stuff from second peter so it's attested to very very early okay now second peter part of the problem with second peter for some is it's wholly different tone from first peter <laughs> While well, 1 Peter has more of a hopeful tone to it and an encouragement to stand firm in the face of suffering, 2 Peter primarily deals with judgment and false teaching. And so for a lot, for many uh, readers, it puts them off from Peter. Uh, 2 Peter's epistle focuses primarily on warnings against false teachers and their teachings. Uh, the false teachers denied the second coming of Christ pursued immorality and encouraged others to do the same and we see similar false uh teaching rebuked by paul in first corinthians where we also find evidence of doubt concerning the resurrection and rampant sexual immorality some scholars suggest that the false teachers in second peter are early gnostics 
but other scholars doubt this, suggesting the false teachers simply adopted an erroneous libertine understanding of grace. And we see this in our culture today. How many people do we encounter on a regular basis that say things like, well, I'm saved by grace, not of works. And what they really mean by that is there's nothing for me to do, right? I, I've declared that I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm good to go, and I'm good to go forever and ever and ever. Have you ever run into this type of teaching? And it's oftentimes employed by those who uh, live questionable lives, right? <laughs> yeah. So what we need to understand is all of this false teaching, all of that, that the stuff that we see today, none of it's new, right? Solomon said in Ecclesiastes <laughs> that... Um, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And, and that's certainly true. Pretty much all of the false teaching, all of the heresies that we've encountered over the past 2,000 years began in the first century. And we see their, their foundations being laid even then. And it's certainly, uh, we certainly see it in 2 Peter. Uh, further, in light of Peter's impending death, and I think that's the other part. Peter could see the writing on the wall, um, so to speak. He had been told by Christ, reminded by Christ, that he would be martyred. And as his martyrdom approached, his execution by Emperor Nero, as that date approached, it pressed more heavily on his mind to make sure that the church in uh, the church down the road would be able to refer back to his teachings. So he wrote First Peter, he wrote Second Peter, and he had Mark transcribe the Gospel of Mark, um, which of course is just Peter's recollection. So. Ultimately, 2 Peter stands as a warning to Christians, a rebuke of false teaching and teachers, and a reminder for Christians to stand firm in light of the return of Christ. So I really wanted to cover that. I'm not going to cover anything else out of these notes. You have them. You can take them and read them to your heart's content. If you have a question about them, I'll be happy to talk to you about them. Um, but the big thing we need to remember as we go through this series is Peter is looking at the early church an early church that is divided in message, an early church that is beset on all sides by false teachers, an early church that is no longer certain. I mean, you can read some of these passages in the New Testament, and it sounds, especially the early letters from the apostles, 1 Thessalonians, right? It sounds like Jesus is coming back tomorrow, right? What did Peter, what did Jesus say to them in the beginning of Acts chapter one? They said, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What did Jesus say? Let me sit down and explain to you all the, all the variances and the, the little nooks and crannies of eschatology. No. Let me sit down and explain to you fully the plan for the rest of all time. No, no, he didn't say any of that. What did he say? He said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons the father is appointed, but it's up to you to be my witnesses. In Judea, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth, right? So we have our marching orders, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I've been given all authority in, under heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and along with you always, even into the end of the age. So we have, the church has its marching orders, and its marching orders are not to sit here and play games with prophecy like it's some type of, uh, like it's some type of, uh, Oh, the, the game ran away from me. But like we're, we're like it's uh, some type of zodiac, okay? Right? We, we're not supposed to treat prophecy like it's a zodiac. Rather, knowing that God is coming, knowing the judgment that waits for the world, right? Jesus came the first time to do what? Save it. Save it. He came. He's coming the second time to do what? Judge it. Judge it. And Dan, Dan, James, <laughs> my Bible teachers, you're all very familiar with what God's judgment looks like. <laughs> Not good, is it? No. Peter's going to remind them of all of that in the epistle. Because as the days grew long and time grew short in their thinking, and Jesus didn't come, many started to say, well, where is he coming? He's not coming back. And so Peter is addressing these issues. He's addressing the false teachers who are teaching people to live in immorality who are pursuing immorality themselves. He's addressing that issue. He's addressing the second coming of Christ. And we need to keep that in mind as we move through this text, okay? So let's look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant. The NIV, this is the NIV. Uh, does anybody have slave? I'm just curious, in your various translations. What translation are you using? It's... Uh... 
the new language translation. It's in new living. New living, living translation. Slave. Okay. Does anybody else have have something similar? Bond servant. Bond servant. Yeah, that's a nice way of saying slave. <laughs> Yeah, so you're, you're going to catch the NIV do this, guys. The NIV, ultimately, the NIV, as in uh, as many other Bibles, you know, they're published by publishers. And I don't know if you knew this, but publishers want to make money. So they're going to put out Bibles, <laughs> right? And they're going to translate things a certain way, okay? Because ultimately, they want to sell Bibles. The word here in the Greek is doulos, that's slave, okay? So Simon Peter, a slave... And then apostle. Apostle means one sent out under orders. Okay, so sometimes it's a direct reference to the group, the twelve, the specific, right? And other times it's just a reference to those sent out under orders. This is why Paul will refer to Barnabas as an apostle. Okay, he's not an apostle as in one of the twelve. Paul wasn't even one of the twelve. Okay. But Barnabas was certainly sent out under orders, just like Paul, when the elders and Paul and Barnabas and others gathered together to pray in Antioch, and the Spirit set aside Paul and Barnabas and said what? They're to go out into the Gentile world. So Barnabas was an apostle, right? Not one of the twelve, but an apostle. Here, Simon Peter says, I'm a slave sent out under orders of Jesus Christ. This should be Jesus the Christ, okay? Christ is not Jesus' last name, okay? Christ is a title. Specifically, it's a title referring to the kingly authority and power of Jesus, okay? He is the Messiah. He is the King. This is something we often forget when we talk about the gospel. The gospel is not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is certainly part of it. But it is not the gospel. The gospel, Mark 1, 14 and 15 and other places, is the coming of the kingdom of God. This is why Jesus' favorite name for himself in the gospels is the Son of Man. Right? He claims to be the Son of Man. Well, who is the Son of Man? Daniel chapter 7 talks about the Son of Man who comes in the clouds of heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Ancient of Days. Where did Jesus ascend to again? Where was that? Oh, that's right, the right hand of the power. That's what the Gospels is about. The Gospels is about the coming of the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ, the anointed, the king. Peter, his slave, has been sent out under orders from the king. And he is writing to us, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith, as precious as ours grace and peace to yours in abundance through the knowledge of god and jesus of jesus our lord so peter is writing in his official capacity as one sent out under orders he is writing to those who have received the righteousness of our god and savior jesus christ he's writing to christians and he's writing to them in the first century because of the things we've discussed the false teachings that inundate the churches likely this letter's destination were the churches of Asia Minor. Now that should set off some red flags. What do we know about the churches of Asia Minor? The churches of Galatia. The churches of Pontus and Cappadocia. What do we know about these churches? How many letters did they receive? I'll give you an idea. Ephesus is in Asia Minor. Galatia <laughs> is in Asia Minor, right? Uh, Colossae Philippi. is in Asia Minor, huh? Philippi. Philippi. Uh, actually, I think no. Philippi is in, in Greece proper, yeah. Greece proper. So all of the, but all of these churches that he planted, and what do we know they struggled with? Just off the top of my head, letters written to the area of Asia Minor, Ephesians, 1 John, Galatians. We starting to see some of what we're dealing with. 1 John was written to the, ch to the church in Ephesus by John the, the Apostle, and it was written because they just had a major church split. Because half your church in Ephesus stood up and said, we're allowed to do whatever we want. We can live however we want. And if you're telling us we can't, you're not Christians. We're the real Christians. And they got up and walked out. That was the church in Ephesus. What happened to the churches in Galatia? You remember? 
Judaizers. Judaizers, yeah. They started listening to all these Judaizers who were talking about circumcision and days and all of these, these foolish things, right? So much so that Paul would say in Galatians chapter 3, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Right? So we have all of these issues going on in that area, and we see all of that in 2 Peter. 2 Peter's warning, uh, the warnings that he gives, he mentions some stuff that we would see in Jewish Apocrypha. Some of the things that the Judaizers would teach. He mentions and talks about those things a little bit. He mentions and talks about the rampant immorality here. So Peter is, is going to start confronting those things. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 2, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We're going to come back to that knowledge. That's going to be pretty important. In verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him, who called us by his own glory and goodness. What does God use his power for? <laughs> what does God use his power for? His goodness? Okay, what do you mean? Well, if, if God's in favor of it, uh huh. if God initiates it, right? it's good. It's good. Man, I'm going to push back pretty hard. Go ahead. <laughs> so genocide's good? If God ordains it. Ooh. Ooh. See, y'all need to watch our... You surely do. You need to watch our class on Wednesday night that we do online. Because we've hit this nail on the head quite a bit, haven't we? You see, God's divine power is for salvation. Cole, you just said his divine power is for genocide. Yeah, it's also for salvation. But God looks at the cultures, at the wickedness, at the evil, and at some point, he has to judge it. He has to judge it. And we get it twisted and confused. You see, we see things in the scriptures like God says, I'm going to wipe out all of the Amalekites because they stood against Israel. <laughs> we look at those passages and we go, oh my gosh, how could a good God command the destruction of an entire civilization? That's horrible. God would agree. Killed, God would agree. He killed three quarters of a million of his own people, but he wouldn't do what he told him. That's right. He says, Dan just said, he killed three quarters of a million people. He's talking about the Israelites as they wandered through the desert because they would not obey him. See, we forget that God, yes, does command Saul to go out and wipe out a whole group of people. He does command the Israelites to go and wipe out a whole group of people. But why does he do that? Did he just get bored one day and decide, hey, I'm done with these people over here, so I'm going to just wipe them out? They don't obey. They don't obey. Genesis chapter 15, church. Genesis chapter 15, God looks at Abraham and he says this. He says, your descendants will inherit this land. Why? Why not Abraham? The sin hadn't been. Okay. The sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. You know, gave, it's funny because... Gave time. Huh? He gave him time. He gave him time. And you can't say he didn't. Who was Melchizedek? Was Melchizedek a Jew? No. Who was Melchizedek again? Priest. 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 It wasn't just a priest. <laughs> High Dude, priest. Jesus. King of Jerusalem. King of Salem. This Salem. king of the city of peace. He wasn't a Jew. Abraham cut him the tent. Archaeologically speaking, the name Yahweh, which is the, the personal name of God, the name that we're, that the Jews would not speak, the, the name that they would transcribe over, um, that name, archaeologically speaking, is known outside of Israel. Is this news to anybody? Do you, what do you think, that the Jews were the only people saved in the Old Testament? Abraham had multiple children, didn't he? What, did Abraham only reserve knowledge of the Most High God, El Shaddai? Did he only reserve knowledge of that for Isaac? Or do you think that he taught his other sons? Do you think Isaac kept it for himself? Or do you think he taught Esau and Jacob? What do we think, church? You know, it's interesting because in Deuteronomy... I think it's chapter 2. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, God says, in, the, in this land, you're not do, you can't touch any of this land because I've given it to the Moabites as an inheritance for them. You can't touch any of this land over here because I've given it to, to your brother Esau. Esau. 
It's his. Look at Acts 17 real quick, since we're here. We might as well. <laughs> we might as well. We're talking about the power of God. We got to go to Acts 17. Acts 17, Paul's in the Areopagus, and he says, from Mars Hill, speaking to the philosophers of the day, in verse 26, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Why? God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. His divine power, church, what we need to understand is God's divine power is constantly bent towards salvation. It is constantly built towards redemption. But what do you do when your child consistently spits in your face? What do you do when the people that you're reaching your hand out to consistently bite it? How long must God be patient? Let me ask you, how many thousands of children must be sacrificed on the altar of Molech before God has had enough? Before God says, enough and I'm done. How much sexual immorality must he endure? How many women must be sold into slavery? How long does he have to bear with these cultures before he says, they've had their chance, I'm done with them, and now comes judgment? Turn over to Jeremiah 18. Yes, sir. How long are we expected to tell them the truth? As long as it's called today. As long as it's called today, do not harden your hearts. Yep. This is the word of the Lord. This is Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. This is the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do this with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If any need time, I announce that a nation, notice he backs up here. He's no longer talking about just Israel. He backs up and he says, if at any time that I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, <laughs> and if that nation, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disasters I had planned. This is Jonah, by the way. Hmm. <laughs> this is why Jonah went to the other ends of the earth, why he went the opposite direction. Why well, he got mad because he knew what God was fixing to do. He knew. He knew if I go to Nineveh God don't say and I tell these people God's going to destroy you, because that was the message, church. <laughs> if I tell these people God's going to destroy you, they might repent. And if they might repent... God will forgive them. We come here and it says, if I plan to inflict disaster on it, but not repents, can I not change? Look at verse 9. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. <laughs> God wants to save mankind. God brought Jesus to the world to do just that. He establishes his kingdom in the new covenant for that express purpose. This is what's God this is what God's power is lent to. His divine power has given us, he says, everything we need for a godly life. Everything we need for a godly life. How so? <laughs> When we, when, with this inception of the new covenant, what comes with it? What comes with this new covenant that they did not have in times past? Ezekiel chapter 37, he says this, right? He says, there's going to come a day where I make a new covenant with Israel. I'm going to take out their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. I'm going to take out the spirit in them and I'm going to put a new spirit in them. Then I'm going to give them my spirit so that they might follow the commands and decrees. God gives us his spirit. This is what he's wanted for. He doesn't, he's never wanted to live in a temple made out, made by human hands. 
He's always wanted to live in his imagers, with his imagers. <clears throat> because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, God has accomplished this. So his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. He says, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Do we understand this? Do we understand at what lengths God has gone to live with us, to live in us? Do we understand that God's goodness and his power and his glory is used on behalf of the church? Do we know this? Have we embraced this? Have we grabbed onto it with both hands? That what God does is good, even in judgment. That though God's judgment is horrible, we know that it is good. I've always found it interesting about the judgments of God, specifically our view of them. If somebody gets off with a crime, let's say we're out here and we witness someone get shot. Brutal shooting. They drive up, they get out of the car, they shoot him 30 times. Get back in the car and drive away. We're all witnesses of it. And it's a horrible crime. And then that person gets off scot-free. Jury nullification. They just let him go. Would, what, would we not be angry at that? Would we not be angry at that? But when God brings his judgment down on evil and wickedness, on the sacrifice of children, on sexual immorality, on and the corruption of the family and of women and of men, when God brings his judgment down on these cultures that do such things, we throw our hands up in the air and we say, oh no, that's horrible. <laughs> we struggle with it. Oh no, it's so bad that God, you know, gave this nation all of these chances and gave them 400 years before he judged them. Church, we need to grow up. <laughs> we need to grow up. Because we've got an indulgent culture. We've got a culture that thinks it can do whatever it wants. And it needs to hear about the judgment that is coming. Not that we want them to go through it. Church, if we wanted the world to go through judgment, we all ought to shut up. Let's just keep doing what we've been doing for 50 years. Let's not put our name out there. Let's not go after anybody. Let's not tell them anything. Let's just be quiet and hide in our buildings. Should we continue to do that? Or should we stand up and preach what is true? That there is a God who will hold us accountable. And that the only hope we can have is if we stand with Jesus. This is our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us. Through his divine power. Through his knowledge. Uh, through the, his knowledge that he has revealed. Right, He has given us his very great and precious promises. What are the promises of God? There's a whole bunch. Give me a couple. Some promises of God. What do we got? Eternal life. Huh? Eternal life. Eternal life. <laughs> okay. Eternal life. Life everlasting. Life with Him. New birth. New birth. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a new creation. I'm no longer enslaved to the kingdom of darkness or to the powers of evil and the devil, but rather I've been set free in Christ. I can now choose to actually follow his law. In fact, he's given me his spirit so that I am motivated and can do that. What else? Give me some more promises. God will employ the earth. Huh? God will employ the That's earth. That's right. God's not going to flood the earth again. No, this creation is reserved for fire, according to Peter. <laughs> he's going to burn it. I think, to me, it's being a true image of mm. That's right. Yeah. I can be a true, I can That's be a true what, imager. That's what the creation was. Yeah, I can be what... Adam was always intended to be in Christ. Very good, yeah. You know what I find funny about the eternal life thing and about the imager thing? You know what I find interesting about that? How much time do you spend with God now? Not How? as much as we should. Yeah. Not as much as we should. Then uh, why agree. would we spend eternity with I, him? I don't agree. You don't agree? I spent every second of my life with him because I didn't spend it before. And mm. I know the difference. And you know the difference. But not Absolutely. everybody does that. Yeah, sure we do. What are we well, doing? Well, we do. You walk in Christ. It doesn't mean that we do it. Right doesn't now. mean that we talk to Him all the time. No, we're doing this right now together. Mm -hmm. But in my in my mind, I think when judgment comes, even though you repented, what's the guarantee you're gonna go to heaven? He promised you. Because He promised you. Well, and that's what this entire series is here to answer. That's exactly right. Right. 
this entire series, because you've got a great point. And those of us in the churches of Christ understand that we have obligation. We have an obligation under covenant. We understand that we are in covenant relationship with God. And because we are in covenant relationship with God, God provides his part, but we are expected to fulfill our obligation. The question is, what is that obligation? And so that's what we're focused on in this series, is to answer that very question. How can we be confident? In fact, Peter's going to say that very thing. In verse 10, when he says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. You should be able to be confident, church. We shouldn't tremble. When someone like me gets up and challenges us on this topic, you know, hey, we're looking forward to eternal life, but if we're not willing to spend our lives now with God, why would we spend want to spend eternity with him? Because that's what's on the table. And if that's challenging to you, so be it. But ultimately, what is it that we're supposed to be dedicated to? And sometimes, sister, that's the problem. The problem is not that we aren't dedicated to spending time with him. The problem is we don't even understand when we're doing it. The problem is we've worked up in our mind something that isn't true. We've created an idol of our father, an idol of Christ. And we have this unrealistic expectation of what it means to be his follower. And that's what I think Dan is talking about. Dan's saying, hey... You are following. You are doing it. And you're seeing you're seeing what the enemy shows you and you're going, No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, no. I am. I know I am. So and I try to be and so many but let, I, I think about so many others like in my family that's not and no. I and I'm trying to teach them and I'm trying to not, you know, talk to them and tell them, I mean, what you're doing is not right. And yeah. how am I going to get them to understand? Because I want to see Well, them and the answer to that right. question is, if they are outside of Christ, there's nothing you can do besides continue to talk to them when given the opportunity to continue to pray for them. Because ultimately, they have to make the decision yeah. to turn. They have to make the decision to put on Christ. If they put on Christ, you need to encourage them to continue walking. But that's what this is about, because this is written to those people who have put on Christ. Right? This isn't written to the world. <laughs> right? If we want the world to turn, we have to preach the truth of the gospel. That Christ is seated as king, and we have an obligation to live in accordance with him, to follow him, to be loyal to him. This is talking about once we've made that decision, what does that loyalty look like? And that's where we come in verse 5, right? He's given us these very great precious promises that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So it is the church, it is Christians who have been delivered from the world and darkness and the things that that produces, which is sin, evil desires, right? The corruption of the world. It is Christians that have been delivered from this. It says in verse 5, For this very reason, then, make every effort to add to your faith. For this very reason, because his power is is for salvation, because he has given us the knowledge of who our God is and what he is doing and what is he, what he's working towards. Because he has given us everything we need to participate in the divine nature, having removed us from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the son whom he loves. Because he has done this, make every effort. Don't tell me you don't have anything to do. Because you have everything to do. God has done, understand this, that in Christ, God has done everything necessary. He's done the lion's share of the work. But the expectation for those who would call themselves Christians is that we endeavor to persevere. That we put in our two cents. That we come along and work with God. How often do we hear this? But if you walk by the Spirit, you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. And the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We see these lists, the similar lists, all throughout the Scriptures. Here it is faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. What does he say in John 13, 34, and 35? A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And it's by this. He says here we have to make every effort. We have to bring everything we have to the table to add to our faith. What is faith? 
What is faith? Belief. Conf Belief. Confidence Trust. in things hoped for. Confidence in things hoped for. Trust. Trust. All of these things. <laughs> the word pistis in the Greek, which is faith, means all of these things. Sometimes, like in James chapter 2, it's belief. Right? In James chapter 2, what does he say? Even the, de even the demons believe and they tremble. Right? So, you can translate this word as faith. You can translate this word as belief. You can translate this word as trust or confidence. The Hebrew writer in chapter 11 verse 1 will say, Now faith is this confidence in things hoped for. Right? Assurance of things not seen. Oftentimes the world will say Christians have a blind faith or a faith without evidence. That is not biblical faith. Okay? A lot of evangelicals have grabbed onto that idea of faith. That is not faith. Okay? Thomas had faith. Thomas had faith. We say, Cole, he didn't believe. That's right. He didn't believe until what? Until he saw. Then he believed. <laughs> then he had faith. The apostles' church have the same faith we do. Exact same faith. They were witnesses of his death. <clears throat> witnesses of his burial. Witnesses of his resurrection. They have the same faith as me. For too long, the evangelical world has looked at the answer to this question as faith. Whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. That is not faith. You can believe that Jesus rose for the dead and still be bound for hell on a one-way ticket. Very easily. Satan is. Satan is. Yep. This is what James is talking about when he says the demons and devils believe and they tremble. That's not to say that there are there there isn't a set of facts that we have to accept, or there isn't a set of facts that we have to believe. But church, the resurrection is a fact. It is not a question mark. Paul calls it evidence in Acts chapter 17. That God is going to judge the world through the man, um, and he's given evidence of this to everyone, through his resurrection. When Peter proclaims the gospel, the fact that he rose from the grave is evidence that he was the Christ, or that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. This isn't a question that I just have to believe with all my heart, and maybe I'm a Christian now. That's not the faith that's being considered. I submit to you, church, that there's an English word that better describes this concept of faith, and that is allegiance. Allegiance. The Christian scriptures teach us that we are to have a faithful obedience. A faithful obedience is one of allegiance. That because Christ is king, because he rose from the grave, because he's seated at the right hand of God, he has my allegiance. This is where it starts. That God holds my loyalty. That I'm going to be loyal to him above everything else. Isn't this what Jesus says? If you don't hate your what? Your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, even your own children. Your own life. Your own life. You're not worthy to be what? Church, that's allegiance. It's still faith. But a better translation for it would be allegiance. So the expectation here is that we do not stop with mere allegiance. That we add to it. That we grow. What is the responsibility of elders again? We've been doing this in the elders class, but what is the responsibility? Go look at Ephesians 4 real quick. Look at Ephesians 4 real quick. So Christ himself, this is verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Look at verse 13. Until when? Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure and fullness of Christ. Who's there? Mm. Who's there? Who's attained to the full measure and fullness of Christ? Raise your hand, because I need to shut up and sit down, and you can come teach. <laughs> Nobody? This is the expectation. The expectation is not, 
that you said some magic words one day and now you just show up you punch a ticket you go home until you receive eternal life that's not the expectation the expectation is this when you pledged your allegiance to christ he handed you a helmet he handed you a rifle and he said off to the front lines with you the question is how many of us turned in that rifle and that helmet for a remote control <laughs> an air conditioner a couch how many of us, when we were handed that rifle, went back and looked at him and went, no, 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 you were supposed to give me all the riches of the world. You were supposed to give me health and wealth and prosperity. The expectation is that we are Christian soldiers fighting on the front lines to save those who are lost in darkness. And church, in this culture, we have failed. We have failed. Since 1973, there are 60 million dead infants. We have failed. And I'm tired of failing. <clears throat> now we've got a choice. We can buckle up and get to work, put on this armor, pick up the sword, and save some people. Or we can sit back and do nothing. But I won't be here if that's what you choose. Because I'm going to fight. I'm going to help save this nation. And I want you to join with me. To do that, we have to add to our faith. We have to add to it knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. We have to become more like Christ. This is why we're doing the eldership series. This is why we preach and teach on what we do. This is why we do these things. Because there is still much work to be done. And guess what? In 30 years, in 40 years, when many of you are past, and I'm listening to some 35-year-old remind me of these things, I guarantee you, because of the nature of our world, he's going to say something very similar, that we have failed. That we have failed. You skipped virtue. I did skip virtue. My apologies. It's, virtue, too. That's important. It's what something is good for. What something is good for. Very good. So we're going to go over this. We're going to move through this ser these series. I've tried to introduce the concept, tried to introduce what we're talking about here. Um, if you have any questions over this topic, or if you, there's anything you need to discuss, I'll be here. Thank you all so much, and you are dismissed. I, I